I've been here to, uh, to this place where they were discovered in some ancient caves. It's uh, on the shores of the Dead Sea, one of the most barren and inhospitable places on the planet. And the Dead Sea, as many of you will know, uh, is a sea which has no outlet uh, except the evaporation of the sun. So you've got this beautiful, but uh, I guess empty and, and barren sea. And then you've got these equally empty and barren cliffs, which are, which are all around. And this particular area is the northwest corner of, uh, of the Dead Sea. And it's a little uh, ancient town or settlement called Qumran. And that's where these Dead Sea Scrolls were found. So the context of when the, uh, the scrolls were found was in 19... 47. So the United Nations had just agreed that uh, the Jewish people could have a homeland and uh, not long after of course World War II and, and uh, all the atrocities that happened under Nazi Germany, there was a lot of sympathy for the Jewish people. So there was general agreement around the world that the Jews should have a place to call their own. But at this time, 1947, it was still Palestine. It was uh, under British control and um, hadn't happened yet. Then in 1948, we know that uh, the nation, the state of Israel was formed. And then of course, there was also um, the Arab West Bank. Jordan came in and, and took control of that. And the Gaza Strip was under control of Egypt. So that's the, the happenings at about the time these scrolls were found. So in November 1949, a couple of young Bedouin um, lads, I think they were, uh, they were goat herders, a couple of cousins. Uh, their names were Jum and Muhammad Ed Dib. And they were grazing their sheep along the, uh, the barren sort of outcrops of rock. And they came across a cave. And as young boys are wont to do, he picked up a stone and threw it in and he was rewarded with a very satisfying crash as it hit uh, some stone pottery and he thought obviously that was interesting not interesting enough to explore it in the moment but he came back a couple of days later and said i wonder what that pottery shard crashing noise was so a couple of days later he he climbs in and he makes what will become one of the most important archaeological discoveries of all time, all right? and especially as it relates to, to biblical archaeology. So inside the cave, these two young Bedouin goat herders, they find four jars. Three are empty, but one is um, containing four scrolls. And apparently it's smelt, a fair bit because it was sort of old, old leather um, and he's got a bit of a shock when he took the lid off um, and then when the, the smell kind of dissipated he came to his senses again and realised that there were some possible uh, important documents um, here. So he brought them to his tent, to his Bedouin family's tent and, um, and actually unrolled them and hung them up um, inside the tent just to I guess check them out. Um, quite enterprising were these young lads. They thought they would, uh, would be worth a little bit of money. Um, so they go to the local antiquities dealer. So there's always been a big trade in antiquities for the pilgrims who, who journey through the land of Israel. Um, so they take them to a dealer who gives them no merit, no worth, not their forgeries, they're, they're worth nothing. But finally, they approach someone who does see some value in it. His name is uh, Kando, um, who tells him, the cousins, that's great, I'll buy these from you, and uh, can you try and find any more for, for me? So they go back, because they just brought um, uh, one, uh, they brought all four scrolls, but then they go and find uh, an additional three more. They eventually sell this Kando guy, the, uh, the Bethlehem antique dealer, um, they sell him four of the scrolls and then the other three that they found on the second visit um, go to another dealer 
called Sahil, who, who buys those other three. And that's a bit of a picture of um, those um, scrolls there. Is that um, picture quite yellow? I'm not sure what to do about that. Hopefully you can still see it okay. Okay, so Kando, who, who just has the, uh, the four scrolls, he has a Syrian Christian friend. He's in Jerusalem, and the Syrian Christian, um, they're looked after by a bishop, and this bishop's name is Athanasius. So Athanasius um, is, is definitely interested, and Kando sells his four scrolls to this bishop, Syrian Christian Bishop Athanasius. So Bishop Athanasius contacts someone called John Trevor um, in the US and um, John Trevor recognises that the scroll that he's looking at is actually the book of Isaiah. All right, and he sees that it's written in very ancient language, ancient script, and he understands immediately that he's likely looking at the oldest biblical manuscript ever found. So he gets some photographs and he sends them to another professor, uh, Professor William Albright at Johns Hopkins University, um, and who looks at the photos and he disclaims, this is the greatest archeological find of the 20th century. All right, so very, very exciting news um, when, uh, when these scrolls were first discovered. <coughs> there were three more scrolls, of course, um, and Hebrew University pr professor Eliezer um, Sunik, he hears um, that this dealer, this other dealer, Sahil, has three scrolls, and so he sneaks across the border into, um, into Jordan, and he recognises that these are valuable ancient scrolls, and he snaps them up um, immediately. Right, and his, his reaction, my hand shook as I started to unwrap one of them. I read a few sentences. It was written in a beautiful biblical Hebrew. The language was like that of the Psalms, but the text was unknown to me. <coughs> and I looked and looked, and suddenly I had the feeling that I was privileged by destiny to gaze upon a Hebrew scroll which had not been read for more than 2,000 years. All right, so what an amazing uh, experience that would have been for this professor um, at the Hebrew University. <coughs> so Bishop Athanasius, he, uh, he liked to make a buck, so he decides he's going to sell this, uh, uh, these scrolls and he decides the best place to get top dollar for them would be in New York in the USA. Um, so he puts his advertisement in the, uh, the Washington Post or whatever they had back then, New York Times, and he says, miscellaneous for sale items. They didn't have a category for Dead Sea Scrolls back then. The four Dead Sea Scrolls, biblical manuscripts dating back to at least 200 BC are for sale. This would be an ideal gift to an educational or religious institution by an individual or group. <coughs> <coughs> so he doesn't find a buyer in the US. <coughs> Instead, the uh, the advertisement is seen all the way back in Israel, and it is in fact um, our friend Eliza, who sends a colleague, uh, and he agrees to um, uh, an exorbitant price in the day, $250,000, to buy these extra four scrolls to add to the collection of seven. Um, and they come back and they are once again in the pro property of the people of Israel. So in the end, there's going to be about 11 uh, mostly intact scrolls um, that are found. And there's a, a picture of, of one there. Okay, so um, in 1949, um, the Jordanian Department of Antiquities um, leads a team is led by a man named Roland de Vaux, and they come to the caves and they start excavating um, these caves. It happens over a process of a few years <coughs> with the help of, um, of some of the Bedouins, 
and they not only excavate the caves, but they also excavate the settlement of Qumran. And um, they find more caves and they find a lot of um, archaeological evidence of the existence of this community who were the custodians of these amazing scrolls. And so they end up finding from uh, over about the next five years or so, in the 50s, um, 10 other caves um, that also housed different um, scrolls and, and different manuscripts. So from um, 51 to, to 57, all these scrolls and manuscripts and, and fragments um, are transferred to the Rockefeller Museum, which is um, in East Jerusalem. And they're painstakingly assembled, uh, and it's a process which, which still continues to this day, actually, mostly in, um, in digital format, working out where all these pieces go and, and to what documents they actually belong. <coughs> in 1967, after the Seven Day War, um, the entire collection, so not just those 11 almost intact scrolls, but all those thousands, which we'll, we'll read about in a second, um, thousands of fragments also come under uh, Israeli control. Um, there's very tight control over who actually is looking after this, even though it sort of now belongs to Israel. Um, Roland Devro and his, his team of, of mostly, mostly Catholic scholars still control um, what happens with these, uh, with these documents which the Israelis were happy to let them have. Um, but the international community sort of put more and more pressure on because uh, um, they weren't sort of necessarily opening out their research to the rest of the world uh, and gradually the rest of the world did get access, especially in terms of uh, access to all the photographs um, that they had. So there's uh, Roland and some of his team uh, at the excavation of Qumran and then also um, piecing together some of the fragments on the, uh, the right-hand side. <clears throat> and then um, even to relatively recently, um, archaeological, archaeological digs have continued and the Hebrew University found a 12th cave. Um, they found a blank parchment um, but they also found other fragments of, of um, manuscripts and also some empty scroll jars and uh, some Arabic newspapers from the 50s and a few other bits of litter which, uh, which indicate that it had in fact already been found before and looted um, and some of those um, artefacts may have in fact been lost. Um, or maybe they turned up later and it was just wasn't identified that they came from this particular cave. So it's still a, a valuable treasure trove even today. So what was, uh, what was found? So as we said, there's not that many complete scrolls. Um, there was about 11 complete documents that are, that are intact and um, all of those were found in Caves 1 and Caves 11. And this includes the, uh, the famous Isaiah scroll, which we'll, uh, we'll talk about in a second, which is uh, what this guy is uh, reviewing with the magnifying glass. So the Isaiah scroll, that's it, um, completely laid out for us. So it's written um, completely in Hebrew, and it's the entire book of Isaiah from beginning to end, all right? Apart from a few, um, very few damaged sections, um, it contains all of the verses which, uh, which we have in our English Bibles um, today. <coughs> so, of course, it is the, uh, the oldest complete copy um, of the book of Isaiah. And it's about a thousand years older than the oldest um, manuscript which was known before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, and it's also notable that it's of the 11 scrolls that are pretty well complete, it's, uh, it's the best preserved and almost completely um, intact. So it's written on 17 um, sheets of parchment and it's very, very long. It's 7.3 metres long and ranges from 25 to 20 centimetres um, in height. And there's um, 59 columns of text. Uh, you should be able to make out there. <coughs> <coughs> so it's 
So all up, there uh, would be 90,000 fragments of, uh, of parchment which were found, and some were just tiny, um, some were quite big and, uh, and legible. And that's believed they belong to about 980 different um, documents that had uh, all broke up. And in one cave alone, cave four, they found um, over 15,000 fragments. So the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, the collection of scrolls does include complete intact manus manuscripts, and then of course manuscripts which had broken up, which were then later reconstructed to give a, a pretty good idea of, of what these documents were. So 30% of this collection of manuscript and manuscript fragments are actually direct Old Testament. Okay, so there's 20, 225 um, manuscripts or, or, or books from the Old Testament. The only Hebrew book um, of, the, of our current Old Testament canon that's not represented is, uh, is the book of Esther. In many books, um, there were several copies or, or several copies of several sections of those books. And of course, as we've said, the, the most important thing about this is that they were a thousand years older than the previously known oldest copy, which uh, was the Aleppo scroll, which, which we'll have a look at uh, in a few slides later. All right, and that Aleppo scroll um, is dated to around 900 years after the birth of Christ. So some of the, uh, some of the popular Bible books, and uh, remember these are, the, I guess, the private collections of the individuals who, who lived in this area and who, who stored these caves. So you had um, 39 different collections or manuscripts of the Psalms, 33 of Deuteronomy, 24 of, of Genesis, and these might be a number of chapters um, of, of these books, um, and, and obviously they're all separate um, manuscripts to, to each other. Isaiah, um, there was the one big scroll, complete scroll of course, but then you've got 21 other um, selections of, of manuscripts or chapters out of Isaiah. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, some minor prophets, Daniel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Job, and 1st and 2nd Samuel. <coughs> and then there was uh, some non-canonical books, all right? Um, these have found their way into the Catholic Bible as the Apocrypha. So these were historical ancient books um, and ancient, uh, I guess, forgeries, but uh, for whatever reason, the, uh, the group at Qumran, the Essenes, we believe they are, decided that they'd be uh, of some historical value and they were part of their collection as well. And then there were other texts that they found, about 50% of the, the manuscripts were non-biblical, um, some even non-religious entirely, and they were sort of commentaries and um, information about everyday life um, in the land of Israel at, around about the time of Jesus. They also talk about um, what happens about Messiah coming, um, preparing for sort of end of days times. There's actually a uh, one scroll, a unique scroll made out of copper, which is, turns out to be a, a, uh, a wild goose chase treasure hunt where they claim to have known the location of hundreds of, uh, of tons of gold and silver, um, and never any of it has been found. Um, and there's also a temple scroll which um, details what their vision for uh, a new temple uh, would be like. So lots of really interesting non-biblical things which were found amongst these, uh, these manuscripts. <coughs> so what is a scroll? So a scroll is is a collection of, of writing and that would be usually on, on vellum or parchment and it's sewn together to make a, uh, a big long um, document which would then be rolled up for uh, convenient storage. And the scrolls were written on uh, mostly with, with black ink and this black ink would be made up of crushed up um, carbon mixed in with either olive oil or vinegar or honey to, uh, to get it a bit liquid. And they'd write on it with a reed pen 
and usually it would be written on, uh, on animal skins. There's a few in the collection that are written on papyrus, but um, maybe it was harder to get, maybe it uh, didn't keep as well, so most of it was written on, uh, on animal skins. Four types of animal skins um, they discovered were used. Um, the most popular was goat, but then also calf, um, gazelle and ibex skins were used on these parchments. So the, the calf and the, uh, the goat skin was used for the really important documents and um, gazelle and ibex were used for other documents which were deemed to be less important. Um, so they, they used the different animals and identifying the different animals and also the thickness of the skin to try and work out which of all these parchments, which manuscript they, uh, they went together with. So that was a bit of a clue which helped them sort some of these documents out, which was uh, no doubt very helpful. Okay, of, of course, in Hebrew, um, everything is written from right to left, opposite to, to English, and there's no pronunciation, no vowels, and no spaces um, between the words. So it's just simply a whole lot of letters, um, which can be a bit tricky to, uh, to, to interpret, no doubt. Most were written in Old Hebrew, um, a few were written in Aramaic, which is the, uh, the, the sort of Persian language, the language spoken at the time of Jesus, and a few were also written in Greek. So who wrote them? Um, we believe the group of people which were called the Aseans, so they were a Jewish sect who separated themselves and went off to, to live in the wilderness, and we believe they lived in that area for a period of about 250 years, um, a little bit before the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they wrote these texts and they, they stored them in these caves. <coughs> Some theorised that uh, they were hidden there uh, and then lost um, just before the Romans invaded and uh, presumably everyone was killed and there was no one there to go back and uh, restart that community and dig out those, uh, those ancient scrolls for use again. So they remained up until relatively recently. Um, Josephus also talks about this, um, this group and it would seem from the, the writings of Josephus that, uh, so that he would support um, the idea in retrospect of, uh, of this community being responsible for, for all of these documents. But then uh, later people have, have come along and said, well, we don't necessarily think it's just the documents of the Essenes. Um, it seems like there was 850 different authors. So they've analyzed all the handwriting and, uh, and gone into detail about the, uh, the actual calligraphy. And they've concluded that it's, it's more people than would likely have, have lived at Qumran. So therefore, it's, it's possible that um, these documents have been a storage place for, um, for texts that came from all over the land of Israel, belonging to, to different religious groups um, in Israel at the time. And some of the evidence for that is some of the documentation describes life outside this, uh, this direct community. Um, and if it was just the, uh, the documents of the people who were living in Qumran, they might not have had as much exposure to write about some of those details. Um, it was certainly written by Jews, everyone agrees on that. Um, and it's possible even that this was sort of the backup um, library for the, uh, the temple in Jerusalem. We moved here for safekeeping when things got a little bit uh, close and real um, with the Romans coming in AD 70. Um, and it does go for a fairly wide range of, of Jewish um, belief and, uh, and, and way of life at the time, um, which, which seems to be a bit wider than um, what would be expected just from from the one community. So there are definitely uh, people who lived in the area at the time, evidence that they contributed to the text, but there may be sort of a wider pool of uh, religious community that was involved in uh, assembling 
these, uh, these manuscripts. So how old are they? Well, we believe they were written from about 200 years before the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, um, possibly up to about 100 years after his, um, his, his birth. Now, obviously, the Romans came in and, and made life very difficult after AD 70, so it's, it's likely they're, they're well before um, the time of our Lord. Uh, some of the evidence of the time period comes from the pottery and the coins which are found. Some of the evidence of the age of the documents comes from radiocarbon dating. Um, and also a lot of the important evidence comes from what they call paleographic dating, which is the dating of the, uh, the handwriting of the time and how the, the characters were formed, which they have some... Uh, indication of the, the history of, of how writing and, um, and the characters developed over time. And all of these things put the, the dating um, at about the same time, which is around the time of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then of course there's internal evidence of the scrolls as well, talking about different real characters in history that lived at the time and, uh, and certain topical events that, uh, that put the, uh, the time period um, again, at the time of our Lord Jesus Christ. So unfortunately, when you uh, take the scrolls out of uh, a very dry, arid environment where they have been preserved for so well for so long, uh, and you expose them to humidity, um, you take them closer to the Mediterranean, um, they start to deteriorate. So by 1990, approximately 20% of the fragments had actually disappeared. Um, fortunately, they were carefully photographed, so there is still the, uh, the photographic evidence if the, uh, the physical evidence has disappeared. But in uh, 1991, they kind of worked out the problem, and they're now in uh, temperature and presumably humidity controlled environments um, under the control of the Israeli Antiquities Authority. And they've got uh, a, a museum called the Shrine of the Book. I've, I've been there. I'm not sure if I've said it before, but I've also been to those caves in, in Qumran. I've actually seen, try to throw a rock or two in myself, um, where those caves are. Um, and it's just amazing to, to be there and, and be connected with, uh, with that incredible history. So there's a museum there um, that's got a big sort of uh, almost lid of a, uh, a clay jar as the the outside centrepiece of the museum. And when you go in there, you, you see a few um, fragments and things that are on display and a very impressive um, photograph, which is lined all along a, a round um, disc, I think it is, that you sort of walk around and have a look at, uh, at all the, uh, a good facsimile of the original um, scroll. Um, they've also got a great website which you can go on um, and have a look at the uh, a high quality photocopy or, or um, pictures of the, uh, um, especially the Isaiah scroll and you can also hover over it and it's translated very conveniently for you as well. And then there's lots of videos and explanations and things like that. So. They've um, really done a great job of, of making sure these scrolls are not only preserved, but also accessible to, uh, to the whole world. So it was a big job and it is a job which, which is ongoing today, mostly in the digital format of sorting out these 90,000 plus fragments of, of all these manuscripts. So they're obviously very small. Some of them are hard to read fading, um, and there's also lots of copies of the, of the same documents as well. So it's slow and, and tedious work, um, but very rewarding and, and important um, because of just how old and, uh, and what this leads to in terms of its, uh, its teaching about the accuracy of, of the Bible. So as we said, they uh, they do a lot of handwriting analysis and they believe there's about 850 separate scribes with uh, unique 
um, styles of, of writing. Uh, the, the thickness of the, um, the documents, the animal skins is taken into account. Um, photography uh, of the fragments has been used to really try and make the text stand out and to be more readable and then also they actually assemble instead of physically moving the jigsaw pieces together they can then move the digital um, images around to try and make sense of these documents. Um, and they have sort of placed on a, uh, a big long table under glass and, uh, and painstakingly uh, assembled and then, and then photographed. In the 1980s, um, more people, more international uh, groups, universities, got access to, uh, to the, the original manuscripts and uh, it sort of was prized away from the, the small original Catholic group who were looking at it and um, that made lots of people very happy. Uh, NASA also got involved and used some of their uh, pretty amazing digital technology and they scanned some of these documents which were just sort of black um, with infrared technology and actually were able to, to get the, uh, the text to, uh, to pop out again um, in these infrared photographs they, uh, they took which was, uh, which was pretty amazing and, uh, and added to the digital collection that could be studied by scholars. Um, yeah. So why are they significant? So as we've said, the, um, the oldest manuscripts, um, original Hebrew manuscripts, were dated around 900 years after the birth of Christ. That's a lot of time that, that's gone by uh, and a lot of questions which were sort of um, e exposed to believers of, of um, the Bible, that how do you know your, your scriptures are true? Um, there's a 900 year gap where people could have fiddled with that, that text. And this sort of um, uh, gives a lot of confidence and credibility to the accuracy of the Bible because this is a document which is at least a thousand years older and dated back directly to the time of Christ where the, the text is almost identical um, to the current, uh, even English versions, uh, and especially Hebrew versions, which have survived and uh, been carefully transcribed um, and translated for, uh, for many thousands or um, hundreds of years. So we also learn a lot more about Judaism, and we learn about life around the time of, uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ which is really important. Before this time, we really only had one main historical book, which was the book by Josephus, The Antiquity of the Jews, which is really interesting and, and accurate, well, um, quite accurate, we believe, but never gonna be perfect. Um, but this just adds, this extra information just adds more weight and, and more detail uh, and more color to, um, to the time period um, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, it, it, it also gives a more comprehensive understanding of, uh, of what the people were like at the time of our Lord Jesus Christ and um, gives us some hints, I guess, about the, uh, the path of Christianity um, coming out of the, uh, the Jewish um, uh, roots. So, this is the, uh, the book we've been referring to, the, the oldest previously known um, document. This was not a scroll, this was a codex. This was a bookified um, form <coughs> excuse me, of the Old Testament. And uh, this was a document which was um, the responsibility of a group of people called the Masorets, right? So, this document is, is, is known as the Masoretic Text. And the, Maseret, the Masorets were a group of people, a group of scribes who were meticulous in copying out the, uh, the Old Testament scripture. So of course they were, they were Jewish um, and they would copy a document or copy the whole codex from, from one to the other 
And when they were 100% sure that they had got it all right, the old copy um, would be destroyed because of that process. That's why we have a, a, a gap where uh, the oldest document was, was 900 AD because they were uh, in the habit of um, destroying these documents. But one survived. It was carefully kept over um, many, many centuries. And uh, that's the Aleppo Codex, which, uh, which had a, quite a long stint in Syria um, before it was finally purchased, kind of stolen, uh, and came into, uh, into Israeli hands. Um, so the, uh, the Masorets, they were known as the counters. So one of their methods of making sure they, they got their text accurate is they were counting all of the letters and they were counting all of the words to make sure they, uh, they hadn't missed anything. <coughs> so they practiced this for about 400 years, this, uh, this group of people. And so what we're wanting to, uh, to compare this to is this incredible detail and accuracy of these, this group of people comparing to this document, which is about a thousand years earlier, and we have 100% confidence that the word of God, which was written back then, has stayed true um, to its original form. And the Dead Sea Scrolls is such an important discovery that, uh, that builds our confidence in the accuracy um, of the scriptures. Um, so we've got a basis um, to, to, to look back on our own modern versions and, and our English translations, and um, we can compare it to that, uh, that copy of the Masoretic text, which is now a bit over a thousand years old, to then comparing it to a copy that's um, over 2,000 year old, and, uh, and can see that it's hardly changed at all. So this gives us confidence, of course, that the Bible is absolutely a very ancient book and, uh, and not some modern forgery. Um, we have a, a very reliable collection and an independent collection that's been missing for, for, th for hundreds and hundreds of years that confirm how accurate our Old Testament scriptures are and dated to even before um, the time of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible is, has been carefully, not just the Old Testament, but also the New Testament, transcribed and, uh, and copied over many centuries. And we have absolute confidence that the accuracy of this has been maintained. Something about the timing, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in 1947. This is just before the miracle of the birth of the nation of Israel. And my question is, was this a coincidence. It might have been, but we we also could see it as, as the hand of God at work. And it could be God telling the world that this people that uh, are in the land, these are my people, and these are the people of the book. And here it is, uh, a brand new copy which had been missing for thousands of years. Um, it's the same book that they are the people of which I, I found absolutely amazing to think about. The Dead Sea Scroll containing the complete copy of the book of Isaiah, is that also just a coincidence? Well, the book of Isaiah contains more prophecies about the Messiah than any other book in the Old Testament. And we can be absolutely certain that this book existed before our Lord Jesus Christ was born. There was no opportunity for Christians to sort of get in there with that, that Jewish text and sort of make it a bit more favourable to interpretations about the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's an example, Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign, behold the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Okay, so a prophecy of Jesus in a document older. Than, uh, than Jesus in the complete copy of the book of Isaiah. And then of course, Isaiah chapter 53, an amazing prophecy about the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ, ready from the, uh, the ESV. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. 
Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although we had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul to death, and yet was numbered with the transgressors, yet bore the sin of many, and makes, makes intercession for the transgressors. Okay, so those words would appear on this amazing, complete scroll um, of, of Isaiah, um, pointing to the Jewish readers at the time, the custodians of these um, incredible documents, that there's more to their, their scriptures than they're looking at, and, uh, and have a look for uh, the incredible passages about the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we've said, the Dead Sea Scrolls, we believe, are the most significant archaeological discovery ever, um, and absolutely in modern history. But it's also worth noting that the Bible itself is archaeological evidence. And the words that we read in, in the Bibles today, even in our English versions, um, are ancient and they're unchanged from, from the original form. So the message that we read is a message that's reliable and the stories that we read are stories which are true. Prophecies written in the, uh, in the Bible, both Old and New Testament, have predicted events which, which have come to pass and we believe that there are more prophecies which are yet unfulfilled that predict the future um, and very near future of our world. So we believe that this unchanging Bible that we have the, the privilege to be able to read is compelling evidence of an unchanging God. Thank you. Thank you.